You know, first we had a good suggestion. If you or I can't do it uh, to our neighbors, the government shouldn't be able to do it either. So if you and I aren't allowed to counterfeit the money, why are we so complacent at a people to allow a secret group of people counterfeit the money and destroy the value of the money in the name of being Federal Reserve and regulating the economy? They have a very, very poor record. In the 100 years, 99 years, it's only uh, one more year to be a cel celebration, or I won't call it a celebration, because the one thing we want to do on the 100th anniversary is to repeal the Federal Reserve Act, of course. Yeah. That'd be great. But they have systematically destroyed 99% of the 1913 dollar. And the one thing that we have to be concerned about, the end stages of the destruction of currency usually goes very rapidly. It can slide, slide, slide for long periods of time. But then when the confidence is lost, it goes quickly, and that's when you get the runaway inflation. There have been hundreds of countries for thousands of years who have destroyed their currencies. And uh, we're on the verge of it. The world still trusts us because once the dollar was as good as gold, and they have no other place to go because if they hold so many of our dollars so it's in their interest to try to prop the dollar up but the rate we're spending 1.5 trillion dollars a year that we don't pay for and the federal reserve has to print the money believe me it won't last and the counterfeiting doesn't work it's immoral for you to counterfeit and cheat it's immoral or should be immoral for the government to be doing the same thing is uh, an instrument for the growth of big government as well as an instrument for the undermining of liberty. The more government grows, the less liberties we have. And if, uh, if politicians are rewarded by just voting largesse for all the special interests, of course they will. And up until now, that has generally been the case. But something, something significantly has happened here in the last four years ago. People are starting to realize those who have to pay the bills and those who are on the receiving end know that this is coming to an end. And this is why these last four years have been very, very different from any other recession or depression because right now we are the big debtor of the, of the world. We are the biggest debtor ever in the history of the world, and the world is all in it together. There has never been a time in all of human history where the whole world was built on debt of a single paper currency. And so it's very, very fragile, and this is all what you're seeing in Europe right now. They're, deep, they're diving now down into another recession. At the same time, the big burden is debt. And what do the Paul Krugmans of the world say? They say the problem is that you're not spending enough money and the government's not spending enough money and the Federal Reserve's not printing enough money. But I think, I think the American people have awakened and they know that doesn't work, it isn't working, and that some changes have to come about. Now, we do know that uh, their financial turmoil leads to political turmoil. If that happens, we could even lose more liberty. But you know what? I have been so encouraged in these last several years to realize that people like you have come out and you care about what's going on. You're studying, you're understanding about the Fed, you know something about Austrian economics, you care about personal liberties, and you want to end these senseless wars that are bankrupting our country. Too. In the last 10 years, uh, $4 trillion was added to our debt just for the wars that we have been fighting. You know, after 9-11, of course, they passed the Patriot Act, and that was supposed to, I don't know how that was supposed to solve the problem by punishing the American people. By undermining your Fourth Amendment rights, how is that going to punish the people who did, uh, did those deeds to us? At the same time, we went involved in wars. Uh, we uh, didn't really go after uh, bin Laden immediately. What we did was we went into a war that they wanted to fight for 10 years. We went into Iraq, and Iraq, of course, had nothing to do with 9-11. There was no Al-Qaeda there, no weapons of mass destruction. And so we go in there, and then, of course, this constant war in Afghanistan. But during this period of time, there's nearly 9,000 Americans have died. This counting, this counts the, uh, uh, the contract workers. There are 40 some thousand who have come back with severe injuries, hundreds of thousands who are now currently suffering, 
from post-traumatic stress syndrome, as well as brain injuries and amputations. It's a real, real tragedy of what's happening. So, if we're going to pay back and penalize the people who did that harm to us on 9-11, how much more death and destruction do we have to put on ourselves for that, those happenings, it, it doesn't solve our problems. And killing a lot more civilians, invading more countries, all that does is stir up more hatred toward us. We have to understand. We have to understand that it wasn't I who invented the term blowback. It was invented. It was defined by our uh, our CIA. And uh, it was well known in the Department of Defense, as, as many other scholars, that one of the main reasons why they wanted to come over here and do us harm, the main purpose and the main concern they had was occupation. And that is the reason I would say, yes, we should occupy the United States of America, not the rest of the world. So the change in the foreign policy is obviously very vital, uh, not only because it would make us safer, it would also save us a lot of money, and uh, it is the, under the conditions of war that people are more willing to give up their liberties. So they say, well, you know, you, you've heard it, I'm sure, I've heard it too many times, that right after 9-11, well, yeah, I know, if they have the picture that we have to give up some of our freedom, but don't we have to give up our freedoms to be safe? That is absolutely right. There is never a time when a free people should ever compromise and say that you have to sacrifice liberty for safety. Because it's not true and we never should concede that principle. In the time of war, and just look at what's happening now, the President by executive order announced that he can uh, kill American citizens. The Congress actually passed the law, the National Defense Authorization Act, which allows, which, which allows the military to arrest American citizens, put them in prison, no attorneys, uh, secret prisons indefinitely. We can't allow this to stand. We as a people should not tolerate what we see on TV and the pictures of the groping and the x-ray and the abuse that we all go through at the airports. Yeah. We need to yeah. get up on that and not tolerate it. Safety and security uh, does drive a lot of people into giving up to sacrifice. Some people want physical safety, some other people want economic safety. Now, I don't know if anybody, I've never met even those in Washington, and there's uh, plenty there that are very controversial, but most, especially most of them, have good intentions on wanting to help people, make sure that they can be taken care of. But if you study history and look at the more socialistic and the more authoritarian a society, the more poor people there are and the worse the environment is taken care of with bigger and bigger government. But guess what? The societies who've had the maximum amount of freedom have had the maximum amount of prosperity, the largest middle class and the most personal liberty. That was United States. It used to be that way and it isn't that way now and that should be our goal. Across the maximum amount of prosperity for the maximum number of people, no special benefits and bailouts for the super rich. And yet today, this is the crisis of what we feel because our, our middle class is shrinking. The people on uh, fixed incomes are getting poorer. Our standard of living has gone down for more than 10 years. People are not getting wealthier. There have been no significant improvement in jobs, in real jobs, in these past 10 years. So although most people recognize our crisis economically occurred in the last four or five years, actually I believe it's been going on since the year 2000. If you look at the statistics, it's been going down here. Real wages aren't going up, real jobs are going down, and people are struggling. Debt is the problem. We have come to believe, because we've been taught so long at our universities, that spending and uh, inflating the currency is a good thing for the economy. It isn't. It's old-fashioned work and efforts and savings that has to make a country wealthy. Now the government does 
courts have a responsibility for that, and that is to protect those principles. That is that uh, they're not responsible for creating jobs and redistributing wealth, but they should have a lot to say about it, like protecting contracts, not destroying contracts and interfering and breaking up contracts, live by the laws of the marketplace. They're not supposed to be able to inflate the currency and destroy the currency, and they're not supposed to over-regulate us to death and not to overtax us. So if you want an incentive system to work where you can go out and you're rewarded for hard work and effort and savings, means you have to recognize, once again, the basic principles of liberty. Our lives come from a creator, or to us in a natural way, our liberties come to us in the same way, and therefore it should follow that the fruits of our labors are ours and not the government's. things start, we're going to be a little bit, we're going to show the rich, that's how the income tax started. But it's the principle that is wrong. If, if the government can say that we're going to only tax you 1%, they're establishing the principle that they have control over 100% because they're deciding what percent you get to keep. So therefore, we, we need to reestablish the principle that what you earn and what is yours is yours and not the government's to be taken from you. That's where productivity comes from, and yet so many people get drifted into this thing, well, well, there's some people who are going to be poor and we have to help them. Uh, but the whole problem there is this entitlement notion is, is not a right. Because some people come along and say, oh, well, I'm entitled to a, a job, a free house, a free education, free medical care. Well, you're not entitled to it because somebody has to take it from somebody else. And the other thing that happens is the entitlement system, they throw crumbs to the poor and take it, and, and the rich get richer. And the housing bubble is a perfect example. First, the Fed creates a lot of credit and say, we're going to make the credit available through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and everybody's going to get a house. Oh, there's some people who don't qualify. Well, we'll lower the qualifications and we'll force you to make these loans. And uh, then there are the mortgage companies and the building companies and the bankers and they get involved and they see all this credit flushing around. They get involved in the derivatives market and they make billions and billions of dollars. It's very obvious a bubble is there. But they say, oh yeah, but look at what we're doing for the, for the poor people. They all have houses and the price of the houses are going up and they keep borrowing against their equity. This is a, the golden age of permanent prosperity, yeah, until the obvious bubble bursts. And then what happens? Who comes crawling to the government? The people who have been making all the money. And then they get the bailout and the middle class loses their jobs and they lose their house. The entitlement system doesn't work. What we need is to have honesty with government, honesty with money, and honesty with allowing people to keep the food of their labor. One thing about the whole concept of liberty and how freedom brings us together, I have said, and I absolutely believe it, I think freedom is popular. I think it's popular with everybody. And it is, once you understand this, it should bring us all together. No matter how we want to use our freedom. There's been too many in the nanny state business who says that, well, we can't trust everybody to spend their money the way they want. They might not do a good job. And we can't certainly allow you to practice personal social habits because you might do things, you might smoke or drink something we don't want you to. So we have to guide you to make you better people and make it a better economy.